A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering Chapter 8 from our Brock Biology of Microorganisms textbook. This chapter deals with viruses and their replication, so let's go ahead and get started. So what exactly is a virus? A virus is defined as genetic element that cannot replicate independently of a living host cell. The virus particle is known as the virion, and it's the extracellular form of a virus. It exists outside the host and facilitates transmission from one host cell to another. And typically a virion consists of either a DNA or an RNA genome with a protein coat, essentially. So you have a nucleic acid with a protein coat called the capsid. And the replication or reproduction of the virus occurs only upon infection. It requires uh, the virus to infect your cells. Uh, you then become the host cell and entry into the host cell is required for replication and oftentimes uh, the virus will use your enzymes in order to help in the process such as your ribosomes such as your polymerase etc so what are some viral components and activities the capsid i was just telling you about this is the protein shell that surrounds the genome of the virus particle and remember the genome could be a dna genome or an rna genome depending on the virus now, the simplest viruses are called naked viruses. They have a nucleic acid genome with a capsid coat. This is uh, most bacterial viruses are naked viruses, and this means that they have no other layers outside of the capsid. Enveloped viruses, on the other hand, which are many animal viruses, have an outer layer consisting of a phospholipid bilayer. And this isn't a membrane that they made for themselves or that they produce themselves. This is a bilayer that they took from the host cell membrane upon release from the previous host cell. Uh, there's also viral proteins in the envelope as well. So uh, here's a new term that you should know, nucleocapsid. What is the nucleocapsid? That refers to the genome, uh, the nucleic acid genome, plus the protein in enveloped viruses, plus protein. So when we say, when we say nucleocapsid, we're talking about the, the, the capsid protein coat as well as the genome, as well as the nucleic acid genome. So here you can see this would be the nucleic acid genome then this would be the this uh, here in the drawing is uh, the capsid coat. Uh, this would be a naked virus because there is no layers outside of the capsid coat. Here you can see this now is called a nucleocapsid. You've got the again the nucleic acid genome. You've got the protein coat. This is called the nucleocapsid. And here you've got the nucleocapsid. So essentially nucleocapsid means uh, nucleic acid plus protein coat. Then this is an envelope virus because again you can see a phospholipid bilayer around the protein coat and remember this phospholipid bilayer came from the previous host cell. It, the, the virus stole it from the previous host cell and inside of this you see here you've got all these spike proteins. These are these are viral proteins. They're typically called spike proteins. So what are some activities of the virus? Uh, well, there are virulent or lytic uh, viruses. During lytic infection, the cell uh, is destroyed because the virus replicates and destroys the host cell. However, during lysogenic infection, this is when the host cell is genetically altered because the viral genome becomes part of the host genome. This is called the prophage and then the, usually they live together, uh, you know, without the virus replicating and without the virus uh, destroying the host cell uh, in a process known as lysogeny. 
So again, remember I said that the viral genome could either be DNA-based or RNA-based. Um, and there's many variety of viral nucleic acid genome that I will show you later on in the chapter. Uh, the, because the, the genomes could be single-stranded, the genomes could be double-stranded, the genomes could be plus sense RNA, which is the same as mRNA, or minus sense RNA, which would be complementary to mRNA. They can be either linear or circular. Uh, they can also be segmented. Uh, what does that mean? Just like you and I have multiple chromosomes or pieces of DNA inside of our cells, viruses such as the flu virus, the flu virus has eight segments of, of genome, so eight pieces of, MR, of uh, RNA, of RNA. So here, this is what I was talking about. Uh, I said there's a myriad different types of viral nucleic acid genomes. You could see here, uh, this is called the Baltimore system, after David Baltimore. He developed a way of grouping viruses based on what their genome looks like. So group one would be the double-strand DNA genome viruses. So you know double-strand DNA, that's like our, our genomes. So group one resembles our genomes as human genomes. Group two are the single-stranded DNA genomes. So these viruses have single-stranded DNA. Group three, double-stranded RNA genomes. Group four, plus strand RNA genome. So this is a single strand RNA, and it's the plus strand. So what does plus strand mean? Well, take a look over here. Plus strand RNA mimics mRNA uh, in that it, it is the same sense as mRNA. A ribosome can attach to plus strand RNA genomes and uh, immediately undergo translation and, and uh, protein synthesis. Whereas negative strand RNA genomes are the complement of plus strand RNA genomes. They cannot be used directly for uh, protein synthesis. They cannot be directly used for uh, uh, gene expression. So group, uh, that was group five. Group six are the single strand RNA genomes that are called the retroviruses. So these are single strand RNA genomes and usually they're plus strand. However, they don't be, they don't uh, behave like group four. They, they behave in a different fashion because they're called the retroviruses. The RNA genome is first uh, reverse transcribed, converted to DNA, and then that, in, that genome is inserted into the host genome and then you know transcription and translation can take place. And lastly, there are these strange double-strand DNA uh, genomes, but they're gapped. There's a gap in the double-strand DNA genome. So again, to summarize, you've got your single-strand DNA genomes, double-strand, single-strand RNA with the plus or minus strand, double-strand RNA. You got your retroviruses, and then you have your gap DNA genome viruses as well. So uh, viruses can be classified on the basis of the hosts they infect. There are uh, bacterial viruses called bacteriophage. There are archaeal viruses, animal viruses, plant viruses, and other viruses. Uh, there are viruses for s uh, species. Uh, there are viruses for strains of species. So, for example, there might be a viral strain that can only infect a particular strain of E. coli, but not another strain of E. coli. That's how selective this uh, virus-host relationship can get. Then there are viruses that can infect multiple different animals, like rabies, but then there are viruses that only infect a particular animal. And then there are viruses that can affect only a particular tissue on a particular animal. So uh, this, this uh, viral specificity to host cell can be quite narrow or quite broad. So viruses come in many shapes and sizes. Viruses are much smaller than prokaryotic cells, ranging from 0 0.02 to 0 0.3 micrometers. That's much smaller. 0 0.02 micrometers would be 20 nanometers, which is a tiny, tiny particle. And that makes sense because uh, essentially, at that point, you've got some sort of nucleic acid plus a protein coat. That's pretty simple. That's pretty small. 
So what does the viral structure look like? Well, I told you there are capsids, these protein coats. The capsomere, the capsomere is, is one individual protein component of the protein coat, of the capsid coat. Uh, so capsids can be put together through self-assembly, a spontaneous self-assembly, or they could require the host for folding assistance. So here you can see these are the individual capsomeres I was telling you about, these protein capsomeres. And these protein capsomeres can assemble the protein coat. And here this string, this string represents the viral genome, the viral RNA genome. And you could see this would be an example of a helical virus. You could see the helical shape forming as these capsomere subunits come together to form the capsid coat. Again, that was, uh, you know, in terms of viral symmetry, that was a helical symmetry. Uh, Rod-shaped viruses, like example, the tobacco mosaic virus, or TMV, this, this would be an, uh, an image, an electron micrograph of tobacco mosaic virus. The length of the virus is determined by the length of the nucleic acid. The width of the virus determined by the size and packaging of the capsomere itself, those protein subunits themselves. There's also what's called acosahedral uh, symmetry of viruses as well. This is a very uh, common uh, shape of virus. There are semispherical viruses, uh, such as human papillomavirus. Uh, why, why does nature adopt the acosahedral shape? It's the most efficient arrangement of subunits in a closed shell, uh, in a closed shell requiring the fewest capsomeres. Uh, so a casohedral are not perfectly spherical. They kind of look like this. Like uh, I, I compare it to a 20-sided dice. If any of you play, uh, play uh, board games that have 20-sided dice, you, you have, you've seen an acosahedral shape. That's a 20-sided die shape. And that's a very uh, efficient way of packaging nucleic acids. And then remember, uh, if you're an enveloped virus, you have an envelope. And this envelope is a, a lipoprotein membrane surrounding the nucleocapsid. Uh, you see these in RNA or G DNA genome viruses. The envelope proteins attach and infect to animal host cells. So uh, the the lipo the phospholipid bilayer has proteins, and these proteins are typically referred to as spike proteins. These spike proteins are responsible for attaching to the host cell, so that you could adhere to the host cell. A process known as absorption. There are relatively few envelope plant or uh, bacterial viruses because the cell wall that they have surrounding the membrane. Usually when you see enveloped viruses, these are animal viruses. The entire virion enters animal cell during infection, whereas in uh, bacterial cells, usually just the nucleic acid enters the cell. Enveloped viruses exit more easily. I'll show you this process in a little bit. So here you can see viruses. You can see enveloped viruses here indicated by the arrows. And here you can see the phospholipid membrane of the virus. Next, uh, Carrying on with the structure of virion, enzymes inside of viruses. Uh, viruses have their own enzymes, and there's a myriad different types of enzymes that viruses can use, depending on the type of virus, its type of genome, and its replication cycle. So here's an example. There's a lysozyme. This is an enzyme that uh, viruses use to make a hole in the cell wall to allow nucleic acid entry. These also lyse bacterial cells to release the new virion. Then there's neuraminidase. Uh, neuraminidases destroy glycoproteins and glycolipids, allowing liberation of viruses uh, from the cell. Nucleic acid polymerases are, are also very important. RNA replicases and reverse transcriptases. Remember I said that... G that um, viruses can have uh, RNA genomes. Well, um, viruses can have RNA genomes. And uh, in order to copy the RNA genome, you must be able to use an enzyme to copy the, the RNA to RNA. So your cells contain 
what's known as DNA polymerase, which is an enzyme that copies DNA into RNA. Or I'm sorry, DNA into DNA, right? You have a DNA polymerase, which copies DNA into DNA. You also have uh, what's known as primase, which is a type of RNA polymerase, which copies DNA into RNA. When you make, when you do transcription, you know, when you copy DNA to mRNA. However, your cells do not possess RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. What does that mean? RNA-dependent RNA polymerase is an enzyme that copies RNA into RNA, into complementary RNA. So the virus has to code for this enzyme. There's also, uh, rem remember the uh, retroviruses that have to copy their RNA genomes to DNA before they integrate the DNA genome into the cell? This is known as uh, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. This is an enzyme that copies RNA, uh, uh, copies RNA into complementary DNA, right? So uh, again, these are two examples of uh, polymerase enzymes that viruses must code for themselves. Your cells do not have RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, nor do they possess RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Uh, and just to make it clear, let me show you something. This might be important for the exam. Um, it would be the it would be the negative strand RNA genomes uh, here. Uh, it, it would actually be be all the RNA, all of these RNA genome viruses three, four, and five. These would require the RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Three, four, and five would would require RNA dependent RNA polymerase and group. Uh, six, the retroviruses would would also re require uh, the reverse transcriptase enzyme. This one would require reverse transcriptase. The other three would require uh, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Now, what's interesting is uh, group four must bring must bring the RNA dependent RNA polymerase with it when it infects the cell. However, groups three and four they could actually because they have plus strand. RNA genomes and plus strand RNA genomes can can act as mRNA. They could actually make the protein inside of the host cell, which is kind of cool. They could infect the host cell with their genome. Their genome is then immediately read by the ribosomes and translated, and then those the the RNA dependent RNA polymerase can be formed right there in the host cell. All right, so so talking about getting into the host cell. How does uh, infection work? How, is the, how does the viral life cycle work? Uh, so the major difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic viruses is nucleic acid entry in prokaryotes and virion entry in the eukaryotes, so how they enter the cell. Uh, phases of viral replication in a permissive supportive host. So this would mean a, a, a host cell where attachment or adsorption occurs and entry is permitted. So first of all, you have to have attachment or absorption of the virion. Then you must penetrate or enter the cell. You either, either the entire virus enters the cell or the virus can inject, inject its nucleic acid into the cell. Uh, usually with animal uh, or eukaryotic viruses, the, the, the viral particle enters. Uh, whereas in bacteriophage, the nucleic acid is injected. Next, uh, synthesis. Synthesis of virus. Uh, so once inside, once the viral uh, genome has entered your cells, the, you know, now we have, to, we have to produce more virus. So how do we do that? Um, you have to synthesize more of the nucleic acid genome and the protein as well, the coat proteins, the enzymes, etc. So you have to have transcription or translation, you have to have uh, the genome replication, etc. Next you have assembly. So once you've made more uh, proteins, you know, in including the capsomeres and the enzymes, and as well as the nucleic acid genome, you must assemble these into new virion and then release. Uh, the mature virion must release from the host cell. So here you can see that process. The virion attaches to the host cell. Uh, this looks like a bacteriophage because only the 
uh, DNA is entering the host cell. So usually you see this with bacteriophage. So here, the bacteriophage, which means virus that infects only bacteria, um, attaches to the host cell. It then allows the DNA genome to penetrate. The viral genome penetrates into the host cell. There's then synthesis of viral nucleic acid and protein, followed by assembly of new virion, and then lytic release of the cells, uh, lytic release from the cell uh, of the virion. And keep in mind, these are naked viruses because the cell was lysed. Usually, if the cell is lysed, that means naked virus is released. If, this, if the cell is not lysed, uh, usually you see that in animal cells. That means an exocytosis or blebbing has occurred where the uh, virion kind of exocytose out of the cell. And that's how the virion obtain their uh, envelopes. That's how they get their membranes, their phospholipid membranes for envelope viruses. So before we move on, um, I think I hear Gizmo playing in the other room. So I'm going to try to figure out what he's throwing around that's making so much noise. So I think, yep, I think that's a good time for a break time with Gizmo. Uh, let me go see what they're up to, and uh, we'll be right back. Oh, that's what you're playing with. Mm. Okay, that's making sense. No wonder you're in here making so much noise. You guys playing with this? Get it! This room is really echoey too because we just... <laughs> they're gonna play ball together. We just built this Murphy bed, so uh, we're gonna convert this into a home gym uh, slash uh, guest room. That bed folds down into a bed, and then otherwise we're gonna have this a gym. So they've been, the reason this video has been loud today is because they've been in here playing uh, with that ball and, it, and this whole room echoes because we haven't been able to decorate. It's just one giant echo chamber right now uh, because there's nothing in this room. So yeah, yeah, so this is what you've been hearing during the video is Gizmo in here just playing ball by himself. And actually with Wiki, Wiki plays sometimes. All right, all right, so, yeah. You gonna go investigate? All right, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. So when the virus infects the cell, there's what's known as a latent period. This latent period is uh, uh, the period of time before the virus re is released from the cell, and this consists of two phases, the eclipse and the maturation phase. During eclipse, the genome is replicated and proteins are translated for the, for the virus. Then during maturation, uh, packaging of the nucleic acids occurs into the capsids. Now, following the latent period, you have release where either the virus is released by lysing the cell, the host cell, uh, or budding from the host cell or it being excreted from the host cell. Here you can see that when the virus is added, there is this latent period which uh, includes eclipse and maturation followed by the release, followed by release. Now let's talk a little bit about a specific bacteriophage, bacteriophage T4. So much like all viruses, attachment is very important and uh, a major factor in host specificity. You have to, uh, I've, been, I've been mentioning this over and over, so it's an important point. Viruses uh, have to attach to the host cell and this is called host specificity. It's very important that a virus must be able to attach to some kind of receptor on the surface of the host cell so that it can infect the host cell. No attachment means no infection, and that means you're immune to that virus. So this requires complementary receptors on the surface of a susceptible host uh, cell for its infecting. 
Receptors in, could include proteins, carbohydrates, glycoproteins, lipids, lipoproteins, and other cell structures. These receptors on the host cell normally carry out uh, regular functions but are used by the virus for attachment purposes. So for example, here are some examples. Uh, vi uh, a virus might attach to the flagellum. A virus might attach to a pilus. A virus might attach to a transport protein. A virus might even attach to the O side chains of LPS. So you see these are all structures that have some regular function for the bacterial cell. However, these are structures that are recognized by special spike proteins, recognition proteins on the surface of the virus cell. So you can see the chi virus recognizes flagellum, M13 recognizes pilus, T1 recognizes the iron transporter, T4 recognizes the O side chains of the LPS, etc. So once you've attached to the cell, you must penetrate the cell. So uh, with the T4, the capsid is left outside, and it's just the double-strand DNA genome that gets injected into the cell. So the viral genome and viral proteins enter the host cell. So the most complex penetration mechanisms of all are found in the tailed bacteriophages. So for example, T4, the tailed ones, th this are, these are what they're talking about. These, these are called complex symmetry viruses because uh, they have a, a cosohedral head, a helical tail, then they have these tail fibers, uh, and then they have tail pins. I, I, I like to state that they they look kind of like lunar landers, right? They look very interesting. They're, they're amongst the most interesting looking viruses. And here are some scanning electron micrographs of these viruses attachment, attaching. So what happens? The virions attach to cells via tail fibers that interact with the polysaccharides on the LPS of E. coli. The tail fibers then retract and the tail pins can contact the cell wall. So you can see here the T4 phage attaches to, uh, recognizes uh, sugars on the LPS of the outer membrane of E. coli. Then the tail fibers retract and the tail pins can attach to the outer membrane of the cell wall. T4 lysozyme forms a small pore in peptidoglycan. So the lysozyme, the lysozyme, uh, this is the site of tail lysozyme activity. The lysozyme um, breaks down the peptidoglycan, the thin peptidoglycan layer. And then the T4 uh, genome, the double strand DNA genome, is introduced into the host cell. So the tail sheath contracts, the viral DNA passes into the cytoplasm, capsid stays outside. Isn't that interesting? So this is how the T4 phage attaches to and infects uh, E. coli that it recognizes. Now you should be aware that bacteria are not completely susceptible to all viruses. First of all, the virus has to be able to attach to the cell, a process known as adsorption. However, Prokaryotes also possess other mechanisms to d diminish viral infections, such as antiviral CRISPR. CRISPR is a very rudimentary immune system for bacterial cells, and uh, uh, viral infections can actually cause uh, bacterium to become uh, uh, immune to further infection by the same virus, by incorporation of what's known as a cassette into, into the CRISPR uh, uh, gene, essentially. And there are also restriction endonucleases. There are restriction endonucleases. These are enzymes that uh, chop up DNA that are present in various species of bacteria. Now, they cleave foreign d uh, DNA. So the foreign DNA, let's say viral DNA gets into the bacteria, the bacterial restriction endonucleases, chop it up. Now, what are some of the life cycles like for bacterial 
uh, bacterial uh, infections. There are what are known as virulent phage and temperate phage. So let's talk about these. A virulent phage means viruses that uh, lice and kill the host after infection. So virulent. Uh, temperate, on the other hand, are viruses that replicate their genomes in tandem with the host genome without killing the host. They establish long-term stable relationship. So this, these types, temperate, can switch between lytic or virulent uh, can be, oh, I'm sorry, they could, they could, they could uh, switch between virulent and temperate. So um, normally how it works is like this. When times are good, and by good I mean no stressors, no UV, uh, there's lots of uh, nutrition around, the bacterial cells are growing, the, the bacterial will be temperate. They will live with the host cell, a process known as lysogeny. Uh, however, when the times are not good, uh, let's say there's UV, uh, there's lack of nutrition, there's some kind of other stressor on the E. coli cell, for instance, well then the bacteria, um, the, the virus can switch to a, a lytic stage and destroy the bacteria. So, so again, you can have lysogeny, which means the bacteria and the virus live together. Uh, or you could have it switch to a lytic or virulent uh, uh, phase as well. This would be when the virus decides to destroy the bacteria and get out. During lysogeny, most of the viral genes are not transcribed. The viral genome is being replicated because it's been incorporated into the host genome and passed on to daughter cells. The lysogen, the lysogen host cell that har harbors the temperate virus. The lysogen is the host cell that harbors the temperate virus. And the, the, gen the genome of the virus that incorporated itself into the host genome, that's called the prophage, the prophage. Okay, so this can result in lysogenic conversion with new properties. All right, so replication cycle of temperate phage. So examples of these are lambda phage, P1 phage. So in lysogeny, Again, the genome is either integrated into the bacterial chromosome or it can exist as a plasmid outside extra chromosomal DNA. The prophage is the viral DNA. Lysogeny maintained by phage encoded repressor protein. So the, the, the phage are quite clever. They have a repressor protein that maintains lysogeny and preventing the uh, preventing the prophage from uh, extracting itself and preventing the prophage from undergoing virulent part of the life cycle. Inactivation of the repressor induces the lytic stage, so you're switching from temperate to lytic activity. So how is this induced? It's induced by cell stress, e example DNA damage uh, from let's say UV, this can induce lytic pathway. So here you can see You've got a temperate vi virus uh, infecting the host uh, bacterial cell. Uh, the, 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 here's the injected viral DNA. And once injected, let's say we enter the lysogenic pathway, uh, the, host, the, host, uh, the host chromosome uh, allows for integration of the viral genome the viral genome integrates into the host genome as a prophage. This is now called a lysogen or lysogenized cell. The prophage is replicated every time the lysogenized cell divides uh, by binary fission. So, and that's when things are good, right? So this could happen for many, many generations exponentially. However, once the cell undergoes some kind of stressor like UV damage, this can cause what's known as induction, which means that lytic events are initiated. Um, the prophage is excised. Uh, the prophage can then uh, synthesize, undergo transcription, translation, synthesizing new proteins as well as new uh, nucleic acids, genomes. Then there's assembly and then there's lytic release, lysis of the cell and release of virion to infect other host cells. So you can see that temperate phage are able to undergo, 
whoops, temperate phage are, under, are able to undergo lysogenic cycles or switch to lytic cycles. Lytic when things go bad. So in uh, animal cells, the, in animal cells, the, you, you follow the same major tenets, the capsid and DNA RNA genome. Uh, you have the, the capsid with the DNA RNA genome called the nucleocapsid. You have to infect and take over the host, assemble, and then release, right? The same, the same steps to infection. However, usually the nucleocapsid enters the cell with animals, whereas in bacteria, remember, the, nu the, the capsid part stays outside and the genome is injected, okay? So how this process works of, of uh, takeover, synthesis, assembly, and release is classified by the genome. Most human viral diseases are caused by RNA viruses, whereas remember, most bacterial viruses are DNA-based uh, viruses. There are two key differences. The entire virion uh, enters the animal cell. Remember, uh, I just mentioned that. And eukaryotic cells contain a nucleus, which is the site of replication for many animal viruses, whereas prokaryotes obviously don't contain nuclei, and the site is the cytoplasm. So. More, more about animal cells and vir viral infection of animal cells. The animal cells, uh, so the viruses bind to specific host receptors, cell receptors, just like, just like in bacteria, you had to bind to a specific receptor on the surface of the host cell, typically used for cell-cell contact or immune function. Different tissues and organs express different cell surface proteins. This is why different viruses can infect different cells in the body. Often viruses only uh, infect certain tissues. And this makes sense because only certain tissues have cells with those particular receptors that the virus recognizes. Entry usually occurs by fusion with cytoplasmic membrane or endocytosis. So here you can see a viral particle touching the surface of a cell, and then it's phagocytosed into the cell, into an endomembrane, and now you have the virus in the center and a vesicle which has been endocytosed around it. Next, you have to uncoat. Uh, that means that the nucleic acid genome needs to be uh, removed uh, from the capsid, and freed into the cell. The uncoating occurs at the cytoplasmic membrane or the cytoplasm. The viral DNA genomes enter the nucleus. Most viral RNA is converted to DNA within the nucleocapsid, and then um, they bind specific host cell receptors, typically used for cell-cell contact or immune function. We already actually talked about that. That was a, that's a weird sentence to put there. Now, uh, the virion assemble uh, and infection outcomes. So the virion assembly and its infection outcomes in animals. Let's talk about that. So virulent, during virulent infections, there's lysis of the host cell. This is the most common type of viral infection in animals. However, there's a latent infection as well. Uh, this would be like the animal equivalent of temperate infection. Uh, the viral DNA exists in the ho host genome and virion are not produced. The host cell is unharmed uh, and unless uh, virulence is triggered. And again, just like, just like in um, prokaryotes, how DNA damage or another stressor can trigger a uh, viral uh, activation, same thing here, you know, UV uh, stressors like uh, stress itself uh, bad diet, etc., can trigger uh, the the virulent form of the of the infection. Can trigger uh, viral DNA to 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 replicate and exit the host cell and harm the host cell. Persistent infections release a virion from host cell by budding, which does not result in cell lysis. So imagine if this is the plasma membrane and the virus is leaving the cell. It can do a process of exocytosis. It can, it can actually bleb out 
where it's called a budding where where the the virus buds out of the cell taking with it part of the plasma membrane of the host cell this is how you end up with enveloped viruses leaving behind an intact host cell and not lysing the host cell this would be a, an example of a persistent infection and it would explain how a virus picked up a plasma membrane how 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 an envelope virus forms there's also transformation is also a potential outcome of a viral infection transformation refers to the conversion of a normal cell into a tumor cell into a cancer so here you can see all those different outcomes here of animal virus infection so uh, so formation of a proviral state and transformation into tumor cells so you got the virus it infects a cell that cell might actually become transformed into a tumor due to the viral infection there are there are several viral uh, infections that can result in cancers such as uh, HPV infection can lead to cervical cancer uh, Epstein-Barr viral infection can lead to um, a type of lymphoma Burkitt's lymphoma etc uh, so you can see here also uh, viral infection can lead to death of the cell you know lysis of the cell Viral infection can lead to slow release of virus without cell death. This would be budding, persistent infection. Or viral infection can lead to virus present not replicating, latent infection, latent infection as well. The, this latent type can later revert, revert to lysis, revert to a lytic infection. And lastly, we're talking about retroviruses here. Retroviruses, remember, they have a RNA genome. However, the first thing they do upon infecting the cell is to convert their RNA genome to DNA. And this is done with the uh, assistance of an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. This would be an example of a uh, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. What does that mean, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase? Something that can read RNA to produce complementary DNA. Does that make sense? So retroviruses, RNA viruses that replicate through a DNA intermediate. Uh, so HIV is an example. They contain this enzyme reverse transcriptase. This reverse transcriptase copies the information from RNA genome to DNA, double strand DNA that is. And then the double strand DNA inserts itself into the into the host genome with the help of another enzyme called integrase and then also once once inside once the the genome is integrated into the host genome um, after the genes are transcribed and the proteins are synthesized and an, an enzyme called protease separates the different proteins from one another and this is an example of a enveloped virus so you see here you can see this is the uh, retrovirus you've got the RNA genome you've got the RNA genome you've got you've also got a host of enzymes that you need for replication of the virion reverse transcriptase so that you can convert the RNA genome into double strand DNA integrase so that you can insert the DNA into the host genome and protease so you can free the different proteins from one another post translationally uh, you've got the uh, cap. Uh, the capsid. This is the capsid here. This is the envelope here. Here are the surface proteins, the spike proteins. You know, GP120 and and such. Uh, here's the viral genome. You've got the gag uh, genes, the pole genes, and the env genes. Um, gag genes are enzymes. Pole genes are the polymerase, and the envelope genes are the you know the the capsid genes. Yeah. Gag genes code for structural proteins. Pole genes encode for reverse transcript, uh, transcriptase and integrase. And the env genes encode for the envelope proteins, the capsid proteins. The genome consists of two identical single strand plus uh, RNA molecules. And here's how the process of replication occurs with retroviruses. So the, the retrovirus infects the cell you have entrance into the cell with removal of the envelope at the membrane. So, uh, 
see the the envelope is removed at the membrane at the membrane and you have the single strand the single strand positive strand RNA viral genome that's incorporated into the cell reverse transcriptase the enzyme uh, um, you know it, it it copies the single strand RNA genome to DNA and then it also makes that DNA copied into double strand DNA now you have double strand DNA which travels to the nucleus with the help of integrase remember integrase allows the integration of the viral DNA into the host DNA so you've incorporated it into the host DNA then you have transcription by host RNA polymerase which forms a viral mRNA and genomic copies genome copies that's how you also get your genome the single strand RNA then goes out into the cytoplasm where it is translated and then with the help of protease the proteins are separated from one another you have assembly and budding release awesome so a lot to learn there that was fun Vir viruses are very very interesting and like I said very diverse so uh, as always please leave any questions you have in the comment box below and I will catch you guys in the next chapter Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, a Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, a Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, a Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.